kind of a recap uh, and an intro uh, to what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the movie Field of Dreams? You remember it? It's one of my favorites. Well, actually, there, I have two favorites, but I kind of separate them. One is a favorite, and then the other is a seasonal favorite. My favorite is Field of Dreams, baseball movie. My seasonal is It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, but this one, couldn't figure out how to make it with a wonderful life fit on this particular text, so we're going to go with Field of Dreams today. Anyway, that movie starring Kev, Kevin Costner, uh, James Earl Jones, um, and Ray Liotta. It's a, we all remember kind of the line that was just repetitive throughout that movie. He's out in his cornfield, Kevin Costner. His name in the movie is Ray Kinsella. And he's out there checking his corn and he hears a voice. And it says, if you build it, it will come. He's looking around and hears it again. Continues to hear this. And it's very confusing to it. Then he runs into James Earl Jones, who was playing the part of a guy, an old journalist, that was kind of a radical journalist when Kevin Costner was growing up. Anyway, his name's Terrence Mann, and he meets him. And so they begin this quest for what this, if you build it, he will come. The meaning of that. And it takes them to all kinds of places, with all kinds of people. And as the movie plays out, you can kind of tell that there's a little bit of a disconnect between Ray Kinsella, Kevin Costner, and his father in the movie named John Kinsella. Don't know his name in real life. But as the movie plays out and he builds this baseball field, Moses Corn down and builds this baseball field. Beautiful field. Lights and everything. And these old baseball players from the 1910s, 20s, 30s, they all start coming back out of the cornfield to play games. And at the end of the movie, Kevin Costner gets out there and there's one guy left, all the other players have left. He looks up and it's his dad. And he wants to know if his dad would like to play catch. And he says, yeah, well, Ray knew who he, who he was, but John Kinsella did not know. Kevin Costner was his son. And as it closes, they're sitting there throwing, or standing there throwing the baseball back and forth. And the father, John, looks at Ray and he says, is this heaven? And Ray says, no. No, it's Iowa. And he said, sure looks like heaven. And then it reverses. And Ray looks at his dad, John, and he said, Dad, is there really a place called heaven? And John looks at him and he says, yeah. Yeah, there's, a real, there's really a place called heaven. It's a place where dreams come true. I want to talk about that today. Is there really a place called heaven? Number one, the answer to the question is yes. But I want to share with you a few things that the Bible has to say to confirm and reinforce that truth for us. 
because there's a whole lot of people out there that don't really believe that there really is a heaven, that there's really anything beyond the life that we live as, as humans. But there's three things I want to I want to point out, and they're not super deep. Okay, number one, heaven is a place. Number two, heaven is a prepared place. And number three, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Okay? Follow me? It's a place. It's a prepared place. A prepared place for prepared people. Okay, try and say that one really fast and not easy. You know, heaven... Um, it's somewhat of a neglected subject these days. Um, I think there's some things that contribute to that. Um, you know, if you take the flip side of it, you know, hell is kind of a subject that a lot of people don't really want to talk about or acknowledge. I just think that, you know, I made a statement uh, two or three weeks ago, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, on the 27th, the day of uh, Diane's baptism, that, you know, baptism is something that is a very foundational truth of Scripture. Uh, heaven is a very foundational truth of Scripture. But yet we probably don't talk about it uh, as often as we should um, there's a lot of hymns thank you Katie wherever you went uh, for uh, the the hymns for this morning tied to the theme of is there really a place called heaven so why do we neglect heaven why do we neglect or society why does the world neglect talking about heaven well, I have a couple of ideas about that. Most of the most of the reason I think is most people have come pretty comfortable talk, uh, living here. Okay, that we like here, and we don't really want to not be here. Um, our treasure for a lot of people is here. Um, I got just Friday, uh, I got a couple of things. I get these devotion things from uh, Crosswalk and a couple of other things every day. And I get one on Friday, okay? You ready? And I'm not, you haven't seen me do this. I'm not gonna read something from my phone. But I got this article Friday, preaching this on Sunday. Are Christians over prioritizing comfort and convenience? Do we put too much emphasis on our comfort, our convenience of this world? I would say that we could probably make a case for that. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, turn, please, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. And John writes in the words of Jesus, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare, going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says to him, to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, 
greatest verses in all of Scripture that we can claim. John 14, 6, where Jesus responds to Thomas and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Then Philip speaks up and he says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Kind of like, come on, give, give us a little more. Give us a little more. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You might want to underline that because that got Jesus in all kinds of trouble. That statement right there. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. They didn't understand it. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And believe me, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Now, that is a comment that is tied to so many of the things that Jesus is doing and saying by evidence of some of the miracles that he has already performed, the teaching that he is doing. And he had already made the statement, you know, about authority in his teaching. And then at the end of Matthew, in chapter 28, the Great Commission, he says, all authority has been given to me by the Father. And that's where we were tying into the <coughs> baptism. Following Christ's footsteps. So, first thing that I wanted to mention is that heaven is a place. Okay, there's a lot of mistakes about heaven out there. Different faith and belief systems believe different things about heaven. Very quickly, share a couple with you. Okay, the Mormon faith. Okay, they don't believe heaven in the same way we do. Okay, they believe that there's three levels or three kingdoms of glory. And the level that you ultimately reach depends on your level of faithfulness. In other words, it's a works-based faith. The better you are, the higher kingdom, okay, if you will, you will achieve in the afterlife. But you do not, they got great commercials on TV, but I'm gonna tell you, they do not believe that Christ and belief in Christ is necessary to be able to go and live immortally in one of those three heavenly kingdoms. That's one. Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a basic belief that, um, number one, there is no hell. Okay, our Bible teaches us that there is a heaven, there is a hell. There is good, there is evil. Okay, you with me? We all in agreement on that? Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses, their faith says that there is a certain um, anointed class that consists of 144,000 people that will be in an anointed class of heaven. Everybody else 
will live in a paradise or a heaven on earth. Um, my question on that is, what's the real draw there? Because I got a feeling those first 144,000 slots, I think those tickets have been passed out a long, long time ago. Okay? So I don't have a chance at that, right? And then there is the mixture of Far Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, uh, and New Age movement, which is really just a conglomeration and a combination of all these different uh, Far Eastern schools of thought and belief systems. And here's the, here's the real basis for what that is. You come up, Greg, you come up with your idea, your belief of God that motivates you to be the best Greg you can be. Okay? Miss Diane, you do the same thing, but you're the God that motivates you and your allegiance and view of that is going to be very different than his. And it's a combination of all of these far eastern schools of thought, which are philosophy, uh, reincarnation, that you come back, and because of what you did in your first life, that influences what you're able to accomplish in your second life, and so on. Now sadly, folks, this is out there. And you don't have to go very far to find it. It, I just, just saying, it's there. Um, that's not what my Bible teaches. My Bible teaches me that heaven is the place from where God operates. Everything that He does, He operates from heaven with another person of himself being that of the Holy Spirit okay those other religions they don't necessarily believe we, we sing that song God in three persons the Trinity Father Son Holy Spirit okay they don't buy it heaven is a place from which God operates Psalm 11 4 jot that down the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord is on his heavenly throne. That's where he operates from. That's where he sends his angels. They're dispatched from heaven. In Daniel 4, verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar made this statement. In the visions I saw, I looked there. Before me was a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. One we'll be talking about in a couple of months. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. The angel Gabriel. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. And the angel said, Greetings, you are highly favored among women. The Lord is with you. Heaven is a place where God operates. Now, he's everywhere. But... Heaven is kind of, uh, that's kind of headquarters, okay? So, what kind of place is heaven? You're going to need to move quick on these. In fact, I'll just give them to you. You go read them. But I'm going to give you the, the main idea, emphasis, and the scripture address. Heaven is a place of music, okay? Revelation 5.9. It's a place of praise. All of these in Revelation, so you can just write them down quick, okay? Revelation 7, verse 12. It's a place of service. Revelation 7, verse 15. A place of comfort, Revelation 7, verses 16, 17. A place of rest, Revelation 14, verse 13. A place of rejoicing, Revelation 19, verses 5 and 6. It is a place of beauty. Revelation 21, verses 10 and 11 and 23. It's 
place where God operates. That's the kind of place it is. The Bible gives us some hints of what heaven is like. It's a place where we can store up our treasures. Remember this verse, Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in where? Heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and destroy. The point of all of this is that there is so much more, so much more in store for us when we reach our heavenly home than anything we will ever know while we're here. It's a prepared place. It's a prepared place for prepared people. I go to prepare a place for you. You know, you remember some of the old movies um, or TV shows? I'm also a gun smoke fan, by the way. Just let you know. <coughs> you remember the early pioneers? We all had it in history class in school. When the pioneers left the east, moving west, exploring, and so many times it would be the men, the husbands who would go ahead of the wives and their families, going west, exploring, finding new land, and they would say, I'm going. What were they? Why were they going? They were going to find a place and prepare it, okay, for their family. And once they did that, what were they gonna do? They were gonna go back and get their family and take them to this place that's been prepared for them. That's what he's done. Now, what's happening here in John 14, okay, we're not to the crucifixion yet, but what he's doing is he is preparing his disciples right now. This John chapter 14 is really a chapter of great encouragement for the Christian. But he is letting them know, hey guys, this is what's coming. And it's not very far away. And so we got to put a lot into a very short period of time. Okay? He was preparing them for what was ahead of them. And he says, once I've done that, I'm going to come back and get you. What lie ahead of him? What lay ahead of him, rather? The cross, the resurrection, and the ascension was still to play out. Now, he already knew this. He knew how. You know, last week we just talked about one of the things he didn't know he didn't know when the son did not know when Jesus was going to come back. Ready or not, here I come. But he's telling them he was going to leave them. He was going to go to heaven and he was going to prepare heaven for them. Now the great news for us is that when he did that, he was preparing heaven for us. Okay? I don't think he got up there and called all the angels together and said, hey, y'all bring your tools. Start, let's, let's start building heaven houses for all my disciples and everybody. No. He's preparing. The preparing heaven for us was fulfilling the prophecies that had been in the Old Testament, and he is fulfilling them, and in doing that will prepare our eternal home. That's what he means by this. I found this very interesting. Now this data is probably at least 12, maybe 15 years old. So, um, when I share it with you, you probably won't think it would be terribly different today. But I cannot say that it would be exact today. It was a poll done by USA Today. USA Today automatically dates it because I don't think they're around anymore. Uh, but I remember reading this survey and I kept it and I put it in a file, put it on my computer, emailed it to myself so I always, always have it. 
It was a survey done by USA Today that showed that Americans are vitally interested in going to heaven. But their opinions, and I quote, about it are inconsistent and inaccurate. It was approximately 2,500 randomly selected adults. Now, this consisted of different places across the country, and a lot of it was just stopping people on the sidewalk in LA or New York or Cleveland or Seattle. And they also sent this survey information out to subscribers of the newspaper. And so they accumulated all this information so that they would have a good cross-section uh, of data to work from. Here's what it said. 72% of those surveyed rated their chances of going to heaven as good to excellent, 72%. 60% of those same people believed that their friends would go to heaven, okay? Just not quite as many of them thought their neighbors would go. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, neighbor, I don't know. I don't know about that guy. 80% said they believe in heaven. I know you'll find this shocking. 67% said they believe in hell. You know why? Because people don't want to believe in that. 96% said they believe in God. So, 96, biggest percentage said, okay, I believe in God. The next biggest, I believe in heaven. The next biggest is, I think I'm going there. The next biggest was, Okay, there's a hell. And the last, the poor neighbors, you know, the 60% thought their friends would go to heaven. That was the lowest ranking. Let me give you some biblical statistics here, okay? 100% of the people who trust Christ as their Savior and Lord will have eternal life and go to heaven, John 3, Verses 14 and 15. You can write that down if you want to. 100% of the people who reject Jesus as Savior and Lord will be condemned and go to hell. John chapter 3, verse 18. Heaven is 100% real. John 14 chapter we're in this morning, verses 2 and 3. Hell is 100% real. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And we can be 100% sure of going to heaven when we've been born again through faith in Christ. John chapter 3, verse 5. And another one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, 1 John. 5.13, where he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of Man so that you may, what? Know that you have everlasting life. Not guess, not think, not hope. You can know. Now, that word right there, in and of itself, validates the existence and reality of of heaven and it'll be better than anything we can imagine opinions about heaven will vary they'll change but the facts are simply this Christians go to heaven when they die okay to depart and be with Christ Philippians chapter 1 in fact uh, I remember Matthew singing a song that based, was based on that scripture to live is Christ to die this game. I think that was like my second week here. I remember the song you did. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Not everybody is going to heaven. In fact, the Bible tells us that more will not make that trip than those that do. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter it. 
but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few will find it. Only those who trust Christ as their Savior will find it. John 3.16, the most popular verse in all the Bible. You know, in verse 5, Thomas was wanting to know, hey, we don't know where you're going. How do we know? And Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Folks, sitting right here, while good, not going to get it done. That just by itself is not going to be enough. I was talking to a guy one time and he kind of got mad at me. Uh, talking about Jesus being the only way to heaven. He kind of got mad. And he said, I've been going to this church since I was in my mom's womb. And uh, I don't know. Maybe. I said, well, good for your mama. But it doesn't matter. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether you go to heaven or not. It doesn't. It's an individual decision that we have to make as individual men, women, boys, and girls. You know what? If I go, it's all up to me. Not my mom. Not Liz. Not Jack. I've told Jack that many, many times. That's the biggest decision you'll ever make, dude. We'll close with the uh, red story of a guy who was uh, a very ambitious traveler. And he went down to South America. And there were a couple villages in particular that he had read about he wanted to go uh, see. So he goes down there. And he starts trying to find somebody that will take him to this particular village, a guy. And so this one guy shows up and, and he's volunteering to take this man to this village. And the guy says, well, have you ever been there? He said, uh, no, uh, no, but, uh, but I've been part of the way to it. Uh, and I got directions on how to get there after that. He said, well, I think I'd probably be a little better than that. So another guy shows up. He says, I'm trying to get to this particular village. Do you know the way? And he said, well, I've been to the top of the mountain. And I've seen the road that leads to that village. He said, but have you been there? He said, no, I hadn't, hadn't been there. He said, well, tell you what, I'll get back to you. Then a third man comes up and he says, here you're looking for somebody to take you to this particular village. And he says, I am. He said, do you know the way? He said, yes, sir. I do know the way. He said, so you've been there? Oh, yes, sir. I've been there many times. He said, in fact, I live there. I know the way because it's where I live. Jesus saying John 14 verse 6 I am the way I know the way you know why I know the way because it's where I live it's a place from where my father operates it's where I live and you and I are connected to my heavenly home because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Folks, it don't get any better than that. That's a great promise. And we as Christians can know that that is where we have spent eternity. And I would tell you this morning, if you are not 100% certain of that, you need to be. You need to be. And I would be honored to talk to you about that, help you with that, or pray with you uh, if you know somebody that is struggling with that.
know why? Because there's a lot of people out there who don't know it. In fact, the Bible says most will not find it. We all know something. Bring them. Pray for them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your promise that we can depend on. That you're preparing a place in heaven for us forever with each one of us in mind. You know each one of us so personally, so intimately. The Bible actually tells us that you know the number of hairs on our head. And yet you are preparing a place each man, woman, boy, and girl that calls on your name as Lord and Savior. We thank you for that promise. Brothers, we close our worship time uh, this morning. If there's anyone here who does not know you as personal Lord and Savior, I pray that, that they would do that, know that before we leave. <coughs> Maybe someone is looking for a new church home Please impress upon them. We would be so honored to have them join in and want to serve along the us. Father, as we sing, as we pray, have your way and your will be done as we sing together. Great. Okay.